closely. Uh, the verse we're going to be focusing on today is chapter 6, verse 1. We'll be focusing again on chapter 5, verse 26 as well. So we'll pick up our reading as we began in um, chapter 5, verse 22, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. And so uh, let's go ahead and start there at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. There are a few people here today who I just want to just give a short review to make sure you're up with us in the context. This whole book of Galatians, Paul has been defending what we call being justified or declared righteous by God, and it's by grace through faith alone, by grace through faith alone, and that's very, very important. This justification or God saying to you, you're all right with me, everything is good between the two of us, it's based on the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He became our guilt offering. It talks about that over in Isaiah 53. He became our sin substitute and our sin offering. And that's over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And he did all of that at the cross. At the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. His work was done. It was complete. Everything that he did was totally acceptable to God. And we want to get this. And it was on my behalf and it was on your behalf, God was very pleased. It is finished. What is our part in this? We are to believe this good news. That's what it is. It's good news that Jesus did all of this, and God's all right with me. That's good news. And so he says, what do, what do we do? What is our part? We are to believe this good news, and we're to receive all that this good news brings to us. One of the biggest things that this good news brings to us is forgiveness of our sins. It also brings acceptance with God, acceptance with God because of Christ, and it, really, it brings the potential of having a relationship with God. There's a there's potential there. It's there for the taking. Do you want a relationship with God or not? It's there for the taking. It's been paid for. It's been provided, and it's been offered by the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this is what we call the gospel. What are we to do? Believe and embrace what's called the gospel of the grace of God. And we have that. It's in your bulletin every week, but it's Acts 2, uh, Acts 20, 24. And then the components of it are in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5. Bottom line, Christ died. He was buried and he rose again for my sins. And there's this great exchange, this great exchange, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. His righteousness for my sin. He got my sin and I got his righteousness. It was the great exchange. That's what the gospel brings to the table, and it's free for the taking, okay? Paul's telling the Galatians, don't leave this. Don't leave this. Don't go another way. Stay with what God has taught you. Stay in God's way. It's grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Don't give up on grace. Don't go back under law. Don't go back relying on your own resources. Rely on Jesus Christ and everything that God has given you free of charge by grace. Stay there, Galatians. And so he went on to remind them, and not only stay and begin the journey, I've touched on it a little bit already, but you progress, you go on to maturity, you go on with God by the grace of God as well. Because the grace of God is also power and equipment to do what God wants us to do. So you go on, you start this thing, you continue and you finish by the grace of God. And so we looked at this, God, the Holy Spirit is the key to everything. We are to do things by his power, okay? His power, his way, not my way or my power, not my way or my power, but his power, his way. Anything that we do our way, Galatians chapter five has defined for us as the flesh, as the flesh. And we study the flesh in chapter five, verses 16 through 21. We are to follow the Holy Spirit's lead. We went over that again last week. We are to line up and we're to get in step with whatever God, the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Again, we're to cooperate with him. 
We're to participate with him. We are to yield to him. We are to follow him. We are to submit to his authority, voluntarily cooperating with his leadership, and we are to obey him. And so this is all tied to the Holy Spirit. We said it, the Bible says it this way. Anybody who is a Christian is being led by God. The thing is, are we following the Holy Spirit, okay? And then we saw that, you know, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to be that as well. And then there were some don'ts. It was put negatively. Don't grieve him by doing your own thing and not following and not yielding. And then don't quench him. When he brings something up, don't try to push him down and shove him somewhere. Deal with what he brings up in our lives. Amen? Amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So don't treat him. So last week I said, hey, you, we all need to graduate and quit being um, cold, secret agent Jehovah Witnesses as we look at Jesus, excuse me, we look at the Holy Spirit like he's a force, like they do. He's a force, okay? And then we, I said, we got to quit being humanist and quit looking at God, the Holy Spirit, like the humanists do. He's the divine power. He's a higher power. Yes, God, the Holy Spirit, stay with me, is a higher power. And yes, God, the Holy Spirit, stay with me, is a force. But we nailed this last week. We screamed it. He is a person. He chooses, okay? He feels. He makes decisions. He is a person. The Holy Spirit shock you. He thinks. You don't believe it, huh? He thinks. He thinks. He thinks, he feels, he chooses. He is a person. Yes, he's a force and a higher power, but he brings personhood first. He thinks, he chooses, and he feels. This is God. He is God, the Holy Spirit. So then with that in mind, thank you for your patience. Paul closed out chapter five at addressing believers' conduct, okay? And so as we get into this, I want to tell you that I have got, got into a little deeper study this week. And there was a man that I ran into um, there online by the name of Tim Keller. He's a theologian, he's a pastor, and he did some things here in Galatians that I had never heard before, I'd never seen before. And he said, okay, I'm getting ready to, to introduce some things here. He said, and I just want you to know some of the people I've studied. So I, I looked, he, he said, I'm Tim Keller, I'm going to present this, but I've studied F.F. Bruce, he's a theologian, Okay, and I studied a guy named John Stott. He's a theologian. You probably have some of these in your library. And he said, and I studied a guy by the name of Donald Guthrie. Now, I had a rude awakening this past week where, well, the last two weeks where I was really high on listening to some teaching from a man, and it was good teaching, very good. But then I didn't know, man had all this drama and trauma in his life later on. And one of our members called me up and let me know about it. And I was like, oh, thank you. I didn't know any of this. So this week, when I got these names, I wrote down everybody's name where I'm getting information from to a certain extent. And then I went online and looked every one of them up. So I can tell you who's dead, who's alive, who's right, who's whatever. I can tell you. So I'm very confident. So I was listening to Tim Keller and he brought some things out and he was saying, hey, I'm, 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 I'm coming from some theologians like Bruce, Stott and Guthrie. I want to let you know that as well. So as we get into this, I want you to stay with me because this could be life changing. We're going to go back now. We're going to go to Galatians chapter five. We're going to go to the very last verse that we went over last week, okay, which is verse 26, okay? So let me read it. I'm going to read Galatians 5, 26. We only have one verse, but stay with me because I think you should get something today if you came here to get something, amen? It might hurt us a little bit, um, but I think we're going to get something. So let's go to um, chapter 5, verse 26, and let's read it one moment. Here we go. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Last week, we had a sermon and we got into the details and we're not going to go there again. You can go online, look at that. You can get a CD on the way out, review that. But we looked at this and we were in chapter five as he was closing it out. We had the fruit of the spirit there. And then he went over to verse 24 and he said, you crucified the flesh. Okay, you um, crucified the flesh. If you're saved, you crucified the flesh. And then we went all the way back to Calvary. We talked about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We showed how you and I died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We arose with Christ. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. And then we said, this is what that's all about. And we talked about these enemies in our lives, these enemies that hinder the word of God, 
the enemies that hinder us from progressing in this thing called Christianity. We talked about the old man. We talked about sin in our bodies. We talked about our flesh. We talked about the world. We talked about the law. We talked about those different things in detail. And so that is really a big key. And if we really understand that, he's closing out, dropping all kinds of bombs. If you understand that, you're all right. You're going you're gonna to be fine as you understand that and allow God to use that in your life. And so we covered that last week. And then he said, okay, in verse 25, if you live by the spirit, assuming truth for argument's sake, you have spiritual life, the spirit is in you. Then he said, walk by the spirit. We said it was a military term. It means line up. It's like in the military. And then let's start stepping. Let's do what the Holy Spirit is calling us to do. And I continue to remind us, he's a person. He thinks, he chooses, he feels. You have to see him as a person because if you just see him as a force or some higher power, you don't really, I don't really allow him to have his way in our lives. We're really still running our lives based on our conception, our perception of how we see God, the Holy Spirit. So if you see him, somebody's thinking, choosing, making choices, feeling things, he can have the same feelings you have when you're disappointed. He can be grieved just like you. Some of us are grieving right now. The Holy Spirit can be grieved and feel those same kind of feelings. He's a person. So we got in there. So then we got into this. And so now we're in our text here, verse 26. It says, let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Most theologians believe that verse 26 is really the, um, the beginning of chapter 6. That as we get into verse 26, we move from talking about who you are in Christ, talking about who God is um, in you, not talking about that anymore, not talking about your spiritual baptism, your spiritual co-crucifixion with Christ. We have all that. That should be in your backpack. That should be in my backpack. We should understand that. We should understand that if I have the Holy Spirit, I have his life, I am to live. I'm to line up and get ready. We should have that. And so now what he's talking about is here's how we live this out. Some of you have that. Well, how does this apply to my life? How do you live this out? What good is it? And all of that. Well, I'm getting ready to tell you, this is getting ready to get heavy till the end of the book because it's going to be about, this is what it's good for. This is how you live it out. This is what it has to do with your life. And it's going to speak to us personally as individuals. And then it's going to say, okay, and then here's how this is lived out in the corporate body. You are affecting things as an individual. You're affecting things as an individual in your home, but you're also affecting things as individual in your local body. Break it down, preacher. You and I as individuals come together in this particular body, whether we're cold, wet, dead, alive, whatever we are, we are having an influence on this particular body. Amen. I need somebody to hear it the way it's really got to be said. I need you to repeat this. I am having an influence. I am having an influence on Berean Bible Church of Denver. On Berean Bible Church of Denver. It doesn't matter what you're doing or not doing. You are having an influence. And so he says, okay, here's what we need you to do. Do not become boastful or challenging each other. And I need you to stay here because this verse, this sentence is the key to everything today. It's saying here, do not become boastful, challenging one another. Now, the word boastful in the New American Standard and in the uh, English Standard Version, it's conceited. Most translations are making it conceited now, and both of those words work. But I got to get in there a little bit deeper with the guys this week, and we understand that old English, we don't use the word, can you say Vain glorious. Say it one more time. Vain glorious. That's old English. And that is really better communicating what we're talking about here. So this word boastful can be translated conceited and it can be translated vain glorious. And so as we get into it, he's giving a command there. We went over this last week, but it's going to be a different twist on it right now. He's commanding these Christians not to become vain glorious. In other words, they could do this. They could do this. And what it's saying is, okay, vain means empty. Glory means honor. So he's saying, don't be, don't continue to be. You remember your death, burial, and resurrection, your crucifixion with Christ. You remember all the things we talked about, about the Holy Spirit. So you can rise above being vain glorious. You don't have to be vain glorious anymore. 
Everything's been put in place. You don't have to be vainglorious anymore. And so as we get into this without glory, that's what we're talking about here, that the folks here, he's trying to tell them, don't be vainglorious because if when you're vainglorious, there's gonna be some challenging or provoking other people around you. You're gonna irritate people. You're gonna kind of, the, the word provoke and irritate means call them out to fight. Yeah, let me start a fight with you. It's, it's about that. And that could be in our homes and it could be in the local body. So when we're vainglorious, we have to be careful because we're people who start fights, so to speak, and then we're people who um, are irritating people. And so as we get into this, okay, break it down. We don't use the word vainglorious, stay with me. When we are a person who is vainglorious, what we're doing is we have some needs in our lives or perceived needs that we're trying to get met ourselves. And it shows up two ways. I either have a superior attitude toward people that I think I'm better than you, you're below me, um, or I have an attitude of inferiority. I'm envious because I think you're better than me and I can't compete with you. Are you still there with me? Okay, stay there, because this is really, really important. Hang on. This is so important. So what it is, is that here's how it shows up. When I am vainglorious and I come in contact with you, I have relationship with you, um, I work with you or whatever the case is, I have on a pair of glasses as soon as I see you and, that, and, and, and Tim Keller uses it like he says, it's like living in the marketplace. We call living in the market, marketplace today networking. Okay, it's a nice word, networking. Everybody knows what that is, networking. But here's what we're talking about. When I am vainglorious, networking looks like this. As soon as I see you, what can I get out of you? What can you do for me? What can I get out of you that'll enhance my life? How can I do something with you that makes me shine more? Are you following me? Are you connecting with this folks? That I, I, I may be conscious, I may not, but I, my relationship with you is about me. It's not about you. What can you do for me? Can you hook me up with somebody else? Can you meet my needs? Whatever that might be. And so we go into relationships with that vain glory thing. Now, we just finished a class at Berean Bible Church, so some of you are gonna be familiar with it. But as I studied this, came up with the same thing. We call it narcissism today. That's the code word for us. Okay, it's all about me. It's uh, what can I get out of you? Everything's about me, that type of thing. And so that's what we're talking about here, that we can be saints who are still battling with um, superiority in our own lives, where we think we're superior or inferiority. But what it is, folks, is we really don't have that co-crucifixion in Christ operating in our lives. We really are not allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way. We're still trying to get our needs met that way and we do that in the church as well are you with me oh guys stay with me because we're only getting one verse today but it shows up in how you help people how you give to poor people it shows up in um, all these different things when somebody has a burden how do you get them to carry it it shows up in how you treat the people who teach you it shows up in so many ways um, these attitudes, it's like you have to have humility operating in your life for these things not to show up. So this shows us all where we really are spiritually, where the fruit of the spirit really is in our lives. And so he says there, um, don't become boastful, challenging one another and envying one another. So we're not really experiencing, let's stay with me now, we're not really experiencing these things when, when we're still trying to get our needs met. I gotta be important, I gotta be in charge, I've gotta be known, I gotta have a name, I, I'm supposed to be treated special, all these different things. When we are operating like that, we are not living Ephesians 1, 6, that I am accepted in the beloved and it's all by grace and God is pleased with me because he's pleased with his son and it's not about my faithfulness, it's about Christ's faithfulness. We don't really believe that when we're still trying to suck things out of other people. When I meet you and I'm trying to get my own needs met so I can be somebody in somebody's eyes, my own. I don't really believe God accepts me because I'm still trying to get people to applaud and praise me. And that's me trying to get acceptance. 
Hello, are we still with me? You still with me? Okay, so uh, believe me, I, I brought it. I brought it today. I brought my mirror. I got my mirror here. I was gonna bring two. I was gonna bring two mirrors because this is all over me, all over me, all over me. So don't feel bad. Oh, I've been somewhere you don't want to go just yet. In a good way. Some of it's gonna hurt, folks. Okay, and so we're not really experiencing it. You know, I'm thinking God accepts me. Uh, based on my own faithfulness or God doesn't accept me, I got to get some acceptance myself, okay? And so as we get into this, we're not really, when we're doing that, we're not really experiencing living complete in Christ. Hello, that's a cute phrase, you're complete in Christ. But not when you're trying to suck life out of people and use people and think you're better than people. And, and I, I want to be where that person is. You're not living a life. I'm not living a life where I believe I'm complete in Christ. That might be cute over there in Colossians 2.10, but I'm not experiencing it, not when I'm trying to suck myself into a big place by eating or drinking you up, okay? And then there's something missing. There's something. I need more of something. I need a new experience. Something's missing in my life. Well, you don't believe you're complete in Christ then. Amen? Those are just ways, okay? So this again this vain glorious person sees people as a means to an end okay we tend to use people and love things use people and love things okay we meet people again to network we talked about that already i need to feel good about me so i can further me what can you do to help me get there and the bottom line is when we're vain glorious we want the glory and we're not trying to give god the glory it's about god's glory not our glory amen and that's why we even get mad because you're messing with my glory but we don't get mad about people messing with god's glory we excuse that but don't mess with my glory hello hello so we got to know what God says. We got to believe what God says. We have to follow what God, the Holy Spirit is leading us and to stay in step, okay? And not fall into this black, deep hole of vaingloriousness or narcissism, or if you want to be even more technical, operating out of the flesh. We just covered it. He taught it to us in chapter five. So that's what he called it, amen? That's what he called it. When I was a young boy, we um, lived in a property over on 24th between Franklin and Humboldt, 24th Avenue. And I was out in the yard playing. I couldn't have been no more than this tall. And I'm out there playing in the yard. I was by myself playing that day. And I turned this way and I heard something go woof. And I turned back and there was a hole in the yard that was so huge, I could not believe it. Now, I didn't have a lot of maturity, but I knew one thing, I better go get mommy. Okay, so I went in the house, I went and got mommy, and I said, the, the ground fell in. The ground, there's a big hole out there, what? And we talk about it. You know, kids are imagining things, but she comes outside and there's this big hole in the ground. I didn't know, I didn't appreciate it, this hole ended up being so deep, they brought in dump trucks of gravel to fill that hole. If I would have been there and fell in that, I wouldn't be here today. If they could have even got me out, I wouldn't be here today. So my mom comes in, get in the hair, you know, and we, we go on and they get all the dump trucks. They don't know why the ground fell in. They said it's possible there was a well there at some time and it fell in. But boy, it took a lot to fill that hole. It took a lot. As we get into this, Paul is saying this now, and, that, and stay with that illustration because I'm going to come back to it all morning long. He says, don't you go near the vain, glorious hole. Don't play over there. Don't play around that. You need to get as far away from that as possible. And we have everything we need. We already talked about it throughout the rest of the book. It's going to be bad for you if you fall in that hole. It's going to be bad for other individuals if you fall in that hole. It's going to be bad for other members of the body of Christ if you fall in that hole, including those even in your own family. It's going to be bad. Don't go near the hole. That's what he's saying. So now let's keep that in mind. And now we get into Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And here I read it. 
Brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. These first five verses, stay with me now, they're about being led of, of the Spirit, okay? They're about being led of the Spirit. They're about living out all the theology and the doctrine that we went over. Here's how you live it out. Now, as we get into verse one, verse one is about restoration as part of life in the Spirit. So stay there, we're gonna talk about it. That's what verse one is about. Then the Spirit-led life in verses two and three is about burden bearing, burden bearing. Okay, these are things that we kind of put as optional. Spirit led life, we get to measure where we're really walking with God through our burden bearing. And we're gonna get two sides of that burden bearing coin. That'll start next week. And then verses four and five in this particular section on um, uh, spirit led, Holy Spirit led life, it's about examination, self examination. We're all good at examining everybody else, amen. But it's about self-examination as part of this spirit-led life. So now we're gonna look at verse one, restoration. Okay, what in the world does, does restoration mean? Let's start with that. We don't use that word. Did you talk any time in theology that this week I need to restore? Probably did not, okay? So as we get into it, this word, um, what is restoration? The word restore in this time, place, and language was a medical term, a surgical term, okay? So it means to men to put back in order again. When somebody's bones were broken, the physician would set their bones, restore their bones so their bones would work right. Somebody's shoulder was out, the physician would put their shoulder back in place. It also means to fix or mend the fishermen. You remember the fishermen with all their nets? They would be mending their nets. It was called restoring their nets. So now as we get into this, what we're talking about is going back to the proper condition, going back to the proper position, being what you were intended to be in the first place, so to speak, medically. So now our context is talking about believers who are headed for trouble, okay? They find themselves knowingly or unknowingly headed for trouble. Stay with my example. There is a big hole over there, and there are some believers who are talking to you backing up. They don't know the holes back there. They don't know they're headed for the hole unknowingly. They're headed for this hole. And then there's some people that are walking forward that are looking up and looking somewhere or talking to themselves or whatever the case may be. They don't know they're headed in the, to the, toward the hole. So there's this possibility of both. And then there's some people who went and they've already fell in the hole. As a matter of fact, they got curious. Let me see what's down there and fell in themselves or they were running and didn't see it and fell in themselves. It might've even been night and they were out there and they fell in the hole themselves. So here's where this comes in. When we are led by God, the Holy Spirit, we will see these people, okay? And it says there, um, brethren, he's kind of showing them some love, right? Brothers and sisters, it's brothers and sisters there, okay? It's either one, it's anybody and it says, even if, okay, even if anyone, okay, it could be anyone, they're caught in this trespass, okay? They're caught in this trespass. And so this is the identity of these people that we're talking about. So they're caught in this trespass. It's a possibility they don't see the hole, as I said, they're, they might be in the hole, they're headed toward the hole, and you are the person who sees them. You see the hole, you see what's happening in their lives. Are you guys with me still? Okay, so what the text is saying is that this is what's going on. And then it says, okay, these are the people that we've identified these people who are um, to be restored. Uh, the word trespass there. Well, before I get there, let me talk about that word if. This is what's called a third class condition. Third class, say it, third class. We're always talking first and second, usually first, assume two for argument's sake. This is a third class. This means this is uncertain of fulfillment. This may or may not happen. May or may not happen, but it's probable. Amen? It may or may not happen, but you and I can be this person looking the other way and fall in the hole. It may not happen because we're hole watchers, you know, but it still could happen. Hey, Ron, turn around and I fall in the hole. Um, you fall in the hole. So it's a third class condition. It's uncertain of fulfillment, but it's still likely. 
if we are not in touch, in tune, all over the things we've talked about in the previous chapter about our spiritual baptism and all that with Christ and the Holy Spirit and all that, um, it's still likely that we could fall into this. Anybody could. So then we get to this word here. It says caught in any trespass. It means to anticipate something first, to do something before time. Have you ever thought about it this way? Do you remember something back in the day? You know, it might have been 30, 40, 50 years ago, or it might have been just 20 minutes ago, where um, in your mind, you decide to do something before it's the right time. God has a certain time and a certain place to do that. And now we're going to do this now. That's the kind of thing we're talking about, where I'm making up my mind beforehand. I am going to do this now. Then it means, it can also mean um, to detect, to fall into something by surprise, or to discover something. So as we're talking about this, we are now talking about human beings who are Christians, okay? And however they got there, they might be anticipating it, they might be planning it, but they got here, they might got surprised, they went around the corner, fell into the hole, didn't see the hole, but that's where they find themselves in this black hole, in this trespass. And the word trespass means an offense, it can mean uh, sin, but I think you'll like this one, trespass means a false step. There's a line and you took a false step and down you went. Okay, that's what we're talking about there with trespass. Okay, um, a lapse even. And so there, that's what's going on. So that's what happened. And so that's the reason why we have to restore them. So again, what is happening is you see them. This is a spirit led life. And so you go and you say, wait a minute, hold up, stop. Don't go any further, freeze. What are we talking about? Turn around, look, see what's there. Let me come get you, or let me come help you. Let me pull you up. Let me get you out of there. That's what it means to restore. Now you're like, okay, Ron, that's simple. What is all that, all that drama you did about verse 26? When we are vainglorious, we're not going to stop and help that person. We're going to say stuff like, they made their bed, lie in it. I would never found myself over in that, in that area of town even. Why are you even over there? What were you doing over there? What do you do? You know, we go into all of that. Oh, stay with me. It's going to get even deeper later. And then, you know what? When we are vainglorious, we're never going to give or do anything for anybody else that cost us something. Oh, stay with me. The spirit, the spirit of God, spirit filled, spirit led. It's like, no, when we do do something, when we do help somebody with the load, we'll get that next week. We have to give up something to help them. Vainglorious people are not giving up anything. If I don't have the extra, you ain't getting any. That's why Jesus said the widow's might. He was so impressed. She didn't have it to give. Everybody else was giving their extra. When we're vainglorious, we're going to give if it's our extra, but we're not going to do anything for anybody else that's going to cost us something. Are you guys seeing this? I mean, this is deep stuff here. It's deep stuff. And so that's what's going on here. So he says, okay, go ahead and restore them. The vainglorious person. Now, stay with me. I think that um, as we, we get into this, we're going to have to touch on both ends of it. So as we get into it, he's saying, you who are spiritual, you who are spiritual, it's plural here. In our context, you who have God, the Holy Spirit, number one, you're saved. You who are allowing God, the Holy Spirit to lead, he is leading, are we following? You and I who are lining up and getting in step with the Holy Spirit, we're the ones who are to go. That is not an elite group of people like the pastors, the deacons, the people over the women's ministry and all of that. No, it's if you have to evaluate what is the Holy Spirit doing in your life and see if you're qualified. So basically everybody's qualified, even if you need to get yourself qualified at the moment, but you need to be spirit led and spirit filled. Is God, the Holy Spirit calling you to do this? And what is he specifically calling you to do at this particular time? And so those are the ones who are spiritual, those in line, those there. And then it says to restore, and this is a command, not an option. See, it's one thing to talk about singing hymns and all of that, but God, the Holy Spirit is saying your maturity, where you really are is coming in this thing of living out every day and treating your brothers and sisters in Christ and your family the way you should be treating them. So are you restoring them? It says you all presently prepare, restore men, put them in order again, bring them back to the proper position. That ain't none of my business. Why should I do that? I'm tired. I already do all these other things. I have a Bible study to teach. 
I got a sermon to preach. I got other things to do. I got my networking to do, those things that build into my own self-sufficiency and my own vain, glorious life, my own narcissism and fleshliness. That's why we don't do it, because we're vainglorious. We won't get anything. Now, that's a little easier to say. What I'm getting ready to say now is harder for me. And I want you all to know I don't have anybody in mind. I have conversations with all of you. Well, I shouldn't say all of you, but I have deep conversations with some of you. I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I'm trying to teach what the text is saying. There are another group of, great, of, of vainglorious people. Please, I'm not talking about anybody, but we got to get the word of God. Amen? I told you it was balanced. There are some vainglorious people that are going to go over into that area, get you out of that hole, and maybe build you a house right there by the hole, because they're going to watch you, and they're going to take care of you the rest of your life. They're called enablers. Okay, they're called enablers. And here's the thing, they, they really don't want you to grow. They really don't want you to come away from the hole because they want you to depend on them. And they're getting their vainglorious needs met through having somebody to take care of and somebody that can depend on me. Hello? That one's a little more difficult and delicate, isn't it? Isn't it? They don't want to teach you how to fish. They want to keep feeding you fish so you'll always be over for dinner. Hello? That's vainglorious too. See, we always go with the nasty stuff, which we should, but there's some stuff that doesn't look as nasty, but in the big scheme of things, it is just as nasty. Why? Because in this context, the enabler does not restore the person. They never restore them. And what we're talking about is restoring people. Oh, it hurts, doesn't it? Oh, it hurts. I haven't even got to it. I'm, I'm doing this, guys. I got confession, got confession. So enabling is vainglorious as well. So the verse goes on, and, and it gets even more deep as we get into it. So as you go, make sure you have the right attitude. Make sure you restore this person in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness is the fruit of the spirit. Remember that? But this word here is talking about gentleness as defined as meekness. Remember meekness? Mildness, power under control. You've got your meekness, you've got your mildness, you've got your power under control. So you're not going in with that self-righteous attitude. Let me get in there, let me fix everything. I'm gonna bust the doors down and I'm here. I'm the savior. I'm the family priest. Uh-uh. It says here, go in a spirit of gentleness or meekness, humility. And I said it before, humility is the key because when there's humility in the house, the vainglory thing cannot exist there. So humility is the key. Not false humility, not pretend humility. Another thing of that whole, that whole thing is even getting up and doing things that appear to be humble that aren't humble, okay? They're not. Um, having a false humility about ourselves, even confessing, uh, we have to be careful even confessing our faults because we can turn that into, it's all about me and it makes me look good. Ask me how I know, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. In the last few years, we did some studies on narcissism. I did some studies on my own. We did some studies on our online Bible study with James Everett. And at the end of those studies, I was like, wow, I have more of that flesh pattern than any other flesh pattern in my life. Hey, yeah, you get into the deepness of this. You get into how it shows up. Even our humility can be false humility. And here's the key, folks. And I'm ashamed to say it, but I have to say it. If you really want to know how much the power of the Holy Spirit is operating in your life, don't come to the church. Don't look at the preacher. Look at your own home. There's where it really shows up. Because the outside preacher, the outside mom, the outside dad, they always look good. Everybody's always on their best behavior at church, including the pastor. 
Amen. And as I saw this everywhere I saw, I saw a mirror. I saw a mirror. That's my flesh. That's my flesh. I didn't feel condemned. I didn't feel beat up. But it's like, it's a true statement. That's my flesh. Lord, I see this. And here's the thing. For some, not everybody, can't put everybody in a box. Until God shows you this, you don't see it. Because I said, God, you have been seeing this for 64 years. I don't need to sing, yes, Jesus loves me, for the Bible tells me so. Because the one who knows me the best loves me the most. I said, and you still having something to do with me? When you've been looking at this garbage, this vomit, this poop for 64 years? Yes. Yes. A pastor. Yes. And the first thing I, I start sharing this, people say, what does Carolyn think about that? Because they don't believe what I'm telling them. I said, yeah, when I started telling Carolyn about what I was discovering, it was almost an insult to her. I've been looking at that our whole marriage. Amen. It's the truth. It's the truth. So, folks, here it is. Here I am. The last two years have been a very interesting two years for me. Nothing was solid. Nothing was stable. Not even the family I came from. Everything changed. Should I be here? We'll see what God says. What does he have to say? And as I've looked at it, I've, I've gotten into it even more. The church is a breeding ground for this type of flesh. You go to a funeral. Oh, Pastor Fox, come sit up here. Pastor Fox, you know, it's a breeding ground, even at people's lowest moments of death. Come here, do that, do this, do that. It's flesh. Some call it narcissism. I've been waiting for the theological doctrinal thing that I could see that I could put something to it. And it came through the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 26, starting at chapter 6, verse 1. This is the truth. This is the truth about me. This is a confession to you. So the man or the woman, and ladies, don't think you're off the hook. One thing about it is as you start to see it in your own life, God only wants you to stay focused on this mirror. But you sure do pick it up when somebody's doing that same stuff and you're like, ooh, I know what that is. I know why you're doing that. Hello? Not looking at anybody. Keeping it right here. See, because that's what we want to do. Put it on somebody else. It's always somebody else's fault. It's always them. No, it's not. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer, repentance, and actually standing on what you say about this whole deal. So, folks, we got to get it. We got to get it. And I'm telling you that um, that's what's been going on with me. So go with the spirit of gentleness or humility. Humility is really a key. It's a very big key. And as we get into it, he says, and why? Because you can fall into the very same thing that you're going to restore. We go back to my hoe. If you're not careful, you can fall in the hole. And you know, it's kind of like swimming. Somebody's drowning. You give them a hand, they're going to pull you in. You can get too close and the person can pull you in. A lot of us think we're Superman. We are Superwoman. We can do anything. We can go around anything and not be influenced. No, the text is saying, you go, you pay attention. You know, tie yourself to something else before you go over there. Make sure you're safe. Make sure you can handle it. I don't know if this is the place to say it, but I think this will work. Uh, please forgive me. I don't mean to in any way be disrespectful to God or his word or anything like that. But the story's told of a lawyer. He was a Christian on his way to a brothel. I say that for the young people, a brothel. Somebody saw him headed to the brothel. He hadn't gotten there yet, but they saw where he was going. He had his car parked out there. And so they come to restore him. He was a lawyer. He had the gift of the gab. He was so good at it, by the time it was over, he had talked them into going into the brothel with him. You get my point? That can happen. So the Bible is saying, when you go to restore somebody, 
You do everything you can so you don't end up, because you can end up in the same temptation they are in. And we've saw some people, there's a possibility that you can end up worse than they are. You know, you weren't even that deep into it, but now you're more deep into it than they were. They've moved on and you're still stuck. You know? Whatever it is, be careful because you can fall into. Verse one, all about a spirit-filled life, but in this particular topic, restoration. Where are you really? Not in the restoration. Where are you really in the vainglory? Got a superior attitude? Got an inferior attitude? Uh, you know, you got those kind of attitudes looking down on people and you're, you're, you're the cat's meow, you're the savior, you're, you know, when you walk in, everybody should bow down and applause. Hello? Are you in the position and don't do the work? That's vainglory. That's vainglory. Hello? It's vainglory. This stuff hurts, guys. It hurts. We need to look at that. Where does God want us? Are we where God wants us? Or are we where we want us because we're getting fed vainglory flakes in the position that we have? Amen? So we looked at the spirit-led life, shock and amaze you, restoring people, restoring believers is part of a spirit-led life. No vainglory here when it's done right. It's about God's glory. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we want to come and thank you for our time together. And Lord, if there was ever a day to pray through a text, it's today. I pray for all of us, Lord, that God the Holy Spirit will really show us where we are when it comes to this whole topic of vainglory. I pray that he will show each of us where we have a superior attitude, where we have an inferior attitude, where our attitude is not honest and truthful. May he show all of us, Lord, our grappling and our striving to get, get needs met that have already been met, but we're not really believing or appropriating, or we just don't think that you really got it. So Father, help, help us show us, Lord, what we really need to see. Teach us even more about how we've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Teach us even deeper how to live by the Spirit and line up and walk by His dictates. And show us, Lord, so we can really go on with you and not be vain, glorious. But we're provoking people, starting fights and stirring up envy in people. And Lord, when we're there, when we are called by your Spirit to go on what we're going to call a restoration mission, may we check and make sure we're sent by you, we're led by you, and may we do it the right way that we're being led by you in our personal lives. And then let us restore, let us put them back, Lord, where they need to be, come alongside of them. We're even quick to punish people, embarrass people, share those things, gossip about people without restoring them. For those who are really too vainglorious to even help and make excuses, Lord help us. And for those who have another agenda, I want you to depend on me and I wanna enable you, help us there as well we probably switch back and forth between the two. Help us to remember where we are and make sure we're tied securely before we go try to help, help someone else out of a pit because we can end up in the pit ourselves. Father, please prepare us. This is just one verse. This being filled with the spirit, led of the spirit. Oh man, we got to talk about burden carrying and taking care of our own burdens. And Lord, we've got to look at how we really are to, if we think we're something at all in this Christian life, we got some learning to do. Father, then looking at our own lives really honestly and truthfully, where are we and what are we really doing? So Father, prepare us. We're only getting warm, warmed up and can't wait to let the congregation know what this word boast means. Oh, Father, it's a war cry and uh, it's let's get ready. We, we share our boast, and the boast is the cross. Can't wait to get there to share it, Lord. I can't wait to get there to share it. So thank you. 
I pray for each person here. I pray that you just have your way. And I pray for my family. I pray for my wife. That you would have your way in all of their, their, their lives as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and let's go for our benediction. It's coming from 2 Thessalonians today, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. It's going to be uh, very applicable to what you've just heard. So we want to go out um, kind of backing up what we have said today. So let's read this out loud and let's read this together. I want to thank you all for coming today and uh, appreciate it and continue to ask you to pray as we finish out this book because it's going to really get, get into us. And so um, be praying about that. Let's read this all together out loud. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself comfort and strengthen your hearts Make them steadfast and keep them unswerving in every good work and word. Amen. You have a great day.